Hey, thanks for joining us today. We're in a new series called Quit Church because your life will be better if you did. I hope you enjoy it today. Brand new series called Quit Church. Quit Church. And before you get all like flustered, I know, I know. I'll explain that to you in, in just a moment. But isn't it, it's a reality, you guys. If you were here last week, there's a lot of people quitting church. Let me know that. There's a lot of people giving up on church. I read some statistics to you just last week. Let me remind you of them if you weren't here. The research shows that there's uh, four out of five churches in America are either plateaued or declining. In the last 20, two, 2,000 years, so the, the existence of the church, the population in America has grown exponentially. It's by the billions, billions exponentially. And the church has not kept up with that growth. So a lot of people are giving up on and they're quitting church. I have this, this friend, he's a mentor of mine, Pastor Chris Songson, and uh, he travels a lot all over the world to uh, speak and do leadership and also help other churches and pastors. He uh, told me a story about this. One time he was laid over in Oregon. He was on his way to go give a speak, speaking engagement, and it really threw off the schedule, so he's a little frustrated. The time that he was going to spend prep preparing when he landed, he needed to now prepare in an airport terminal. And if you know anything about airports, you know, those aren't the most comfortable places to, like, have any think time is in a terminal. He's trying to find a comfortable spot, a, a place to plug in. He's on, like, plastic chairs trying to set his stuff down, and it just wasn't working. So he's admittedly frustrated in a very unchristian-like way. He's telling me this story, and he says that, that he's, he hears someone call his name from across the terminal. He says, hey, Chris. And he goes, and he looks, and it's his buddy. His buddy is like in the same, this Oregon airport. And they, they get to talking, and, and his, his friend's like, hey, what, what are you doing here in Oregon? He tells him the situation. He tells him you know, he's right, what he's trying to do. He's just trying to find a little time to think and to work on this, this talk he's given and to some leaders. And, and his friend goes, hey, well, I'm, I'm on my way to the Admiral's Lounge. You should join me. And Chris goes, you can't go in there. You're not a pilot. To which, I don't know, I didn't know this, but, but and Chris didn't know either. You know, the Admiral's Lounge is not just for pilots or it's not even for pilots or admirals. But he goes, no, no, man, come on, come follow me. And they go literally just across the terminal. And there's this tucked in little, little area with the reception desk that says Admiral's Lounge. And, and Chris is getting a little freaked out because his friend is leading him in like, are you serious? Dude, you're going to get us in trouble. You can't go in there. And he goes, and he, he turns to him and he says, Chris, are you serious? You don't, you've been flying for years, thousands of miles. You don't know about the Admiral's Lounge? He says, you're going to love this, man. He takes him into this thing. Out here in the, in the airport terminal, it's all like sterile and, and plastic and, and concrete and all that stuff. And, but you open the door to the Admiral's Lounge. It's just like a new world. It's like ambience and lighting and couches and ports to plug into and refreshments. And it was just like, he just was like, what in the world is this? It's not for admirals or pilots at all. It's actually for frequent flyers of this airline. In fact, when they checked in at the receptionist, the receptionist asked, asked for both their IDs, and she types in Chris's information, and she goes, oh, well, welcome, Chris. Your membership has been, you've had a membership for the last three years. And he goes, hey, he, and he didn't even realize, but she said, like, several years ago, you racked up enough miles for you to, to have this membership. You just never activated it. And so I, I liken that to how we treat God and our relationship with God and his church. A lot of us are like we have this airport terminal relationship with God. And even with the church, like we're living in the terminal when God has so much more available for you that you are not accessing. It's right across the, it's just a few feet away for some of you across the terminal. You just access what God has for you. Do you know that there are over 3,000 promises in the Bible that are all for you? All of them. Now, now, most of them are conditional promises of God. Okay, there are the unconditional promises of God, like his love. Do you know God will love you unconditionally? He will never stop loving you no matter what you do or how far you run or how much you, you fight. God will never stop loving you. That's one of his unconditional promises of God. But many of the 3,000 promises in the Bible are conditional promises where God says, hey, if you do this, I'll be faithful. If you do this, I will show up in your life. I will, I will do this. And so, uh, so if God, listen, if God wants to bless your life, like he does, he wants to bless you with his promises and his presence. He's looking to bless your life in ways that you have only imagined. What's holding you back from getting that blessing? What is, why are you sitting in the airport terminal when God has invited you into the lounge? 
Jeremiah 29, 11 says, God says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you. Do you know God wants to prosper your life? He wants your soul to prosper even as your life prospers. And I've read a lot of leadership books. I've read a lot of motivational books. I, and I've read a lot of motivational quotes on social media like you have probably. And all of them kind of say the same thing about winning. Like if you want to win, then you can't quit. Like so it's keep moving. Don't give up. Never stop. No excuses. Get it done. And a thousand other ways to basically say if you, if you want to win, then, then, then don't quit. But today I'm inviting you to embrace a word you will not hear me say very often. It's this word, quit. All right? I'm, I'm going to teach you how to quit today. Now, some of you are thinking, this is a message I can apply, Pastor. Thank you. This is great. This is a good. Now, before you start, you know, getting, let me, let me tell you what I mean. I don't mean, in our, in our society today, in our culture today, we, have, we quit all too easy things. We're big quitters, okay? We quit everything. We quit on people. We quit on our relationships, on marriages. We quit our marriages. We quit on businesses. We quit our gym memberships. <laughs> we just, we quit, we quit off a bunch of stuff, but that's not the quit I'm talking about. I'm talking about a different type of quitting that needs to happen. Listen, if you want to earn your degree, then you got to quit spending time on other things and put it to your study. If you want to lose weight, then you got to quit your bad eating habits. If you, if you want to save money, then you got to quit spending all of it. If you want a good, uh, if you want a good attitude, then you got to quit your negative thinking. Okay? Look, look, listen. Uh, very, very often, the way to win is to quit. Is to quit. Okay? And, and, and so a lot of you know how to win. It's like you've heard a lot of sermons. You know the word. You know the Bible. You know how to win. Maybe you've, learned, maybe you've read some leadership books like me, motivational books. Maybe you see it on social media. You know. You know. You know how to win. The problem isn't you're not knowing how to win. The problem is you don't know what to quit. You can't win unless you know what to quit. Come on, somebody. Are you catching this today? Okay. So, so I, I wanna, I'm doing a series to teach you how to quit. Okay. You guys need to learn how to quit because I can come up here and give you all these principles and all this the truth and stuff, but if you don't quit the things that are holding you back, you'll never be successful. And God has so many promises for you, promises for your success, promises for your finances, promises for your relationships, promise for peace and love and promise joy, all this stuff, but you got to learn how to access the Admiral's Lounge. Like you, you've already, you already have it. You're a child of God. It's already yours, but, but you're just, you're satisfied with the cultural mindset of what of church is the approach to a relationship with god and culture's approach to church and you're not accessing all that god has for you because you need to learn how to quit come on somebody so so today quit church when i say quit church i know i know it kind of people were asking me like quit church pastor what is what is it now i'm not I, i'm not saying like quit church altogether quit is quit is the descriptive word it's the adjective right it's it's hey we need to learn how to quit so that we can win. We need to be a church that not just knows how to win, but a church that knows how to quit and what to quit. Are you following me on this, guys? Uh, you just, you need, to, you need to know what to quit, when to quit, what needs, and, and I don't preach on this a lot, but it's, it's, it's worth doing a series on, I think, because I can teach you how to win, but I also need to te teach you how and what to quit. And I'm not talking about quitting going to church altogether. I'm talking about quitting our casual comfortable, non-committal approach to a relationship with God in church. That's what we need to quit. It's, it's the version of church that you, you've become accustomed to. It's the culture of church instead of God's idea of church. That's what we need to quit. That's in, in order to have access to all the promises, the presence, and the blessings of God, we got to quit that kind of approach to God and approach to his church. So I'm going to give you four messages, four weeks teaching how to quit. Okay, I'm going to teach you how to quit in four messages. Today, as we begin the Quit Church series, I'm going to begin with this thought. This is the first thing you need to quit. Take some notes with me. Write it down, you guys. We got to quit expecting that we're going to wake up in heaven. <laughs> quit expecting to wake up in heaven. Like, like some of us are, we, we are expecting this earth to be our heaven, and it will never measure up to your expectations of heaven. Heaven is that place where all oh, there's no sorrow or crying or death and fear and all that stuff. And some of, some of us, look, this is one of, the, one of the best things you can do for your faith 
for your life, for your relationship with God, is, is to have this understanding, this realization that heaven is not now, it's something I'm looking forward to. To always have this awareness, this is how Paul says it in, first, or in Philippians chapter 3. He says, many live, live as enemies of the cross of Christ. And it's going to shock you on how people are actually living as enemies of the cross of Christ. It's not that they're actually combating. No. Look at this. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. And their God is their stomach. So their stomach has become their God, so their enjoyment, the things that they can consume and enjoy, which God doesn't mind you enjoying stuff, all right? That's not, but it, he's saying it's become your God, that you're living for enjoyment. And the glo their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on what? On earthly things. We've just forgotten that there is a home, a heaven, and I'm just so consumed with earth and earth things, it's wrapped my mind around. Now, look, that's how he says you become an enemy of the cross, by having your mind so consumed with earthly things, but he wants to remind us, our citizenship is not here. It's in heaven. We're just passing through this place, and we eagerly await, meaning like, I'm anticipating heaven. I'm anticipating that day where I get the fullness of my salvation, the fullness of all the promises, the fullness of my peace, the crown of glory. I'm eagerly awaiting that day. It ain't coming now, but it's coming from my Jesus, my Savior. He's going to return one day. Yeah. This is one of the best things you can do for your faith and for your relationship with God is just to quit expecting earth to be heaven. Quit, quit, quit expecting this to, to, get, to get everything now and here. It's not going to happen. It's not going to meet your expectation. In fact, write a little extra verse down, John chapter 14, verse 6. John chapter 14, verse 6. It's a very awesome scripture. In the, in the context of this scripture, the disciples are really depressed and discouraged, and they come to Jesus to, get, to, to just get some help. And, 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 and right before John 14, 6, they come, and he, he tells them, hey, don't be discouraged. Don't be, I know you're depressed. Don't be depressed. And you, you think that Jesus... You know, the miracle worker, or, or, you know, this, this loving God and man would pray for them or something. Don't be, don't, we would go, don't be depressed. Come on, man, come on, man. Pray for you. Or he would do a miracle or something for him, but that's not what he did. In John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, Don't be discouraged. In my Father's house are many rooms, and I go to prepare a place for you so that you can be where I am. You see, the disciples would, and people would constantly bring Jesus a earthly problem. And Jesus was constantly giving them a heavenly solution. He, he, he was, and I'm, if, I believe that if we were to come to Jesus with some of those, de, those discouragements and the depression and the things that don't work out on earth, because earth is so bad, and oh God, I think Jesus would he, would, he wants to know your problems and he cares for you and he loves you. But I think the first thing he would say is, don't be discouraged in my father's house. Or many rooms, hey, here, I know it's not going to work out, but can I, just, can, I, can I get you to see a bigger picture? Because I have gone to prepare a place for you, and I need you to eagerly await. Don't forget, be in anticipation, expect, I'm going to come back and get you so you can be where I am. And it's just one of the best things you can do for your faith, is to have this awareness, this understanding of heaven. That earth is not heaven, but we often try to make, and this is what messes it up, we try to make earth heaven or try to act like earth is heaven where we're getting everything now uh paul tells first timothy this in first timothy chapter six he says command those who are rich in this present world so we got some stuff here in this world and in america we do we, we got it better than a lot of people else in the, it, it, around the world he says hey command if you've got stuff and you got freedom and you got you got health in the, in the present world don't be arrogant and put your hope in that wealth, in what you in this earth, don't 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 put your hope in that. No, it's so uncertain. But put your hope in God, who richly provides us everything for our enjoyment. So God doesn't mind you enjoying. He actually is the one who provided for you, so that you can enjoy it. He doesn't mind you enjoying it. But with that, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And in this way. They will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation. Not now. We're not supposed to lay up treasures now, but for the coming age. Like for, for, my, for my heavenly home, so that they may take hold the so that. If you do that, in order so that you can take hold of life that is truly life. Like there is a life beyond this life that you need to be awakened to and realize that you need to quit 
expecting it now, living for the now and expecting heaven or earth is going to be your heaven. And when we have that perspective of making this world our heaven, we make some choices that are built on a foundation of uncertainty. It's all uncertain. And instead of choosing to bear our cross, we choose to make earth our heaven and it never works out. Let me show you some of those choices, what choices we make, you guys. Write some notes with me, guys. The first choice is that that we choose pleasure over the promise. That's one thing that we do. We try, to, we try to make earth our heaven by choosing pleasure over promise. And by the way, I really believe that, that, that culture has influenced the church so much. Every one of these, these points I'm going to give you is the influence of culture on church, the pursuit of pleasure. The devil never tells you the, the price, though, does he? He never tells you the price, that the price of the pleasure is the promise. That's the cost. The price of pursuing that pleasure, I'm forfeiting the promise. There's a, a story that illustrates this really well with Jacob and Esau in Genesis chapter 25. Um, Abraham, the father uh, of, of Isaac, Isaac marries Rebekah, has two kids, Esau and Jacob. Esau was the oldest, and he, he became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob, was a, was, he, he was a peaceful man and liked to, liked to dwell in the homes, okay? This is what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 25. It says, once Jacob was cooking some stew... Esau came in from the open country, famished, and he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some, some of that red stew. I'm famished. And then Jacob replies, first, sell me your birthright. Like, first of all, that's jacked up, Jacob. Like, that's, that's messed up. Different message, but that's straight up messed up. He says, look, I'm about to die, Esau said. Now, this is the, what I want to highlight here. He says, what good is the birthright to me? Like, what good is is the promise if I don't have the pleasure now. If I, don't, what good, if I don't have what I need now, what good is the promise of the birthright? And the birthright in the Hebrew culture was a very coveted and prestigious thing. It went usually to the eldest son. It gave him most of his father's, if not all of his father's, inheritance, honor, position, power. And, and look, Jacob is not the only one who's forfeiting his, the promise for the pleasure. There are so many people today who are forfeiting all the promise. That, that are not accessing the promises of God that he has for you for a moment of pleasure, for temporary fleeting pleasure. We have this, you know, the, the habit now thinking. And the problem with habit now thinking is that we never pause to consider the consequences of our actions. The living in the moment, willing to pay any price to kind of get what we want. He's not the only one sacrificing our future for momentary pleasures. It's, it's what we often do to try to make earth heaven. And here's what Psalm says, or is it Proverbs? Let me see up here. Proverbs 21, yeah, it says, He who loves pleasure will become what? Become a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not become rich. Hey, we need to quit choosing pleasure over the promise. Here's the next thing that we choose that we honestly need to quit, you guys. We need to quit Choosing convenience over commitment. Quit choosing convenience over commitment. Convenience is like the easy way. What is, what is convenient, easy for me? Um, write the word down next to commitment. Will you write the word covenant down? Because that's actually the type of relationship that God has called, in, called us into, a covenant commitment, a covenant commitment. Um, and whether, if you're new to like, Christ, or you're new to the church, can I tell you something? Like, there is nothing expected of you. You don't need to, you don't need to, like, like, if you're just searching out faith in Jesus, and, like, you're on this journey of truth, this is a safe place for you to go on that journey and figure it out. I just want you, I want you to know that. But if you are a Christian, if you're a disciple, look, hey, before you quit church, we at least give it a try first. Just give it a try, because I think the church that a lot of people are quitting are the, it's the convenient church. It's the what's easy for me, what's best for me, is it, is it fit in my schedule and in my timeline? And I think that, that God has called the church to be more than just convenient, what, is, what meets your schedule. It's, it's a, it, God has called us into a covenant relationship. And the, and the most important relationships are marked by covenant. You know, like your marriage. Your marriage, your marriage isn't a marriage because you signed a piece of paper or even you had a ceremony. Your marriage is a marriage because you made a covenant commitment before God to that person. That's why it's a marriage. Okay, that's, that's what makes you married. And, and just because you say you're a Christian or you go to church doesn't make you part of God's community. 
It's the covenant commitment that we have made together before God that causes his church. All right? So, so if you're a Christian, you're part of God's global church. You're part of the church, global, yeah. But, but if you're not part of a local community, a local church, then that's like being a part of the human race but living your whole life in an orphanage. You think about that. It's not God's plan. It is not God's plan for you. He, is cre- he wants us to live in a covenant commitment. And the reason I believe that relationships aren't working, our relationships aren't working, by and large they're not. Our marriages aren't working, relationships, your rela- our relationships with God's not working, relationship with church isn't working because they're marked by personal convenience and not by commitment. Personal convenience as in what's good for me, is it still good for me, is it going to be, what do I get out of it as long as it's, it's good for me, then I'm in, but if it stops being good for me and doesn't make me happy anymore, I'm out. You haven't even given that relationship the foundation it needs to succeed, okay, because we're choosing convenience over commitment. Hey, you got to quit that, church. Hey, you want to win? You, you want to win? You got to quit that. This is what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7. It says, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is convenient, isn't it? Hey, it's, it's easy for me. It's convenient for me, that wide gate. And it leads to destruction. You know, it's just because it's easy doesn't make it right. Just because it's convenient. Often that road, he says, hey, that leads to destruction. And those who enter, there's a lot of them. There's a lot who are taking the easy road, who are choosing convenient over a covenant commitment and leading to destruction. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard. That leads to life. It's not always convenient, easy, is it? It takes a commitment that goes beyond your personal convenience. We've got to quit living, quit choosing convenience over commitment, church. Here's the next one we need to quit. And this one is another, a huge one that's like, just again, the culture, society, and society is influencing the church so much. We need to quit choosing consuming over contributing. We live in a very consumer-driven culture, don't we? Very, like, I mean, we are seeing ads, and, and it, it's like, it's a very consumer-driven culture. In fact, you may not even notice, but when you're shopping at Target and, and Walmart and stuff like that, you know those racks that are strategically placed right there for your kids to cry about? You know what I'm talking about? They just, they happen to find the thing that they want or the thing they, they think they want, they need or whatever. And it's just, they're, they're, they spend millions of dollars to figure out what goes on those racks to get your kid to drive you crazy. Do you know that? Or to, or to spark something inside of you like, oh, I need that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and put it, on the, put it on the rack. Yeah. It, you know what they call that rack, that rack right there by the checkout? It's called the impulsive buyer's rack. I'm not kidding. That's what they call it. It's called the impulsive buyer's rack. We, we live in this consumer-driven culture, and this has infiltrated the church, you guys. And the, the problem is not consuming. Like, we got to, we're humans, okay? We have to consume to live, right? I mean, you got you to. You got to consume to live. That's not the problem. The problem is not consuming to live. The problem is living to consume. That's the problem. See, in our culture today, it, it, you are marked, you, like, you get your, we place value and identity on, the, on someone based on what they consume. So based on what you drive, the car you drive, the house you live in, the clothes you wear, the music on your playlist, basically you are what you consume. It, it's, where, it's where a lot of people get their identity, get their value from. And then we approach Christianity from this mindset, from a consumer-driven culture on what it can do for me this week and next week and as long as it does and when it stops being... Man, God has called you. Listen, God didn't call you just to consume. He called you to contribute. He's called you to contribute. James chapter 1, verse 22. Um, I could probably preach this message every week. And this, be doers of the word. Like, like, you know how to win already. I mean, a lot of you know how to win. You know how to have a successful relationship. You know how to, you know how to win with God. You know, you know, what, you know what to do. You know the, what discipleship looks like. You've heard it. A lot of you do. But the problem is, not, not that you don't know how to win, you don't know how to quit. That's what's holding you back. Be doers of the word and not just hearers, only deceiving yourselves. We're choosing, we're choosing consuming over contributing. Here's the last one, and this one's huge, you guys. We need to quit retreating, you guys, over reconciling. And that's what we choose. We're trying to make, we're trying to make earth heaven. And it just is a lot easier to retreat, to run, isn't it? 
It's a lot easier to just sweep it underneath the carpet, act like it's not there. A lot of people, they're, they're running from God. They're running from church. They don't want, they're running from those things because they don't want to reconcile their hearts with God, what they did, and they're filled with shame and guilt. A lot of people run from their relationships, retreat from their relationships because it's, they don't want to do the hard work of looking into someone's face and reconciling. We choose, hey, we choose to retreat instead of reconciling. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1, it says this. It says, the wicked run away, and there ain't nobody chasing you. <laughs> ain't nobody chasing you. God ain't mad at you. Ain't nobody chasing you. You're, and we run away. We retreat. But the godly are as bold as lions. The godly don't run away. The godly don't retreat. The godly, I mean, stare it in the face. The godly do the hard work to reconcile. So church, here's, here as we begin this series, we need to quit. We, guys, we need to quit what? Quit chasing pleasure. Quit, quit, quit choosing pleasure over the promise. There is so much more that God has for you in your relationship with him and even your relationship in the body of Christ. Quit, cho- quit sacrificing the promise for temporary pleasure. Quit choosing convenience, the easy road. I'm telling you, it'll continue to lead you to destruction, okay? It's not about what's easy. Don't you quit choosing convenience. Choose commitment, okay? Stop consuming, Instead of contributing, we got to quit this consumer mindset. God didn't call you to consume, He called you to contribute. And then we need to quit retreating from what we were made for. Listen, you were made for this amazing, authentic, vibrant relationship, an amazing community, this expression of Christ called the church. You were made for that. God made you for that. And while it may be easier to retreat and live in isolation, the godly are as bold as a lion. They do the hard work of reconciliation. God's plan for our lives, you guys, was never to accept that this world was the best he could offer, was the best for our lives. No, no, it's it's not. His plan was for us to take the initiative, to do our level best, to not, to quit trying to make earth heaven. No, no, no. His plan was for us to reflect the glory of heaven on earth. That's his plan for the church. That's his plan for you, Christian, disciple, not to make earth heaven, but to reflect God's glory of heaven to earth. Look, at this is how Hebrews says it. Hebrews chapter 10 says it this way. The, the writer of Hebrews giving some encouragement to the church, writing specifically to the church and what the church is supposed to do, says this. Discover, hey church, discover creative ways to encourage others, to motivate them towards acts of compassion. Come on, let's, so let's do what we can. Let's be creative. Let's do some, some random acts of kindness. Let's do a love week. Let's go out on to downtown and to union. And let's, just, let's just encourage others and motivate them towards some acts of compassion, doing beautiful works as expressions of love. Hey, this is not the time to retreat. This ain't the time to quit. This ain't the time to pull away. That's not the time to, and, and neglect the, the assembling of the saints, one translation says, to, uh, to neglect the gathering together, to neglect meeting together, as some have formed the habit of doing. A lot of people are quitting church, but they're not. I believe they're quitting their version of church, not the real church. They're quitting the convenient, cultural, comfortable church, not God's church. Hey, it's not time to pull away and neglect the meeting together as some are, have formed the habit of doing because, let's say this out, out loud, the highlighted, because we need each other. We need each other, church. We need each other. And we, look, we need to quit expecting to wake up in heaven. Stop expecting that earth is going to be heaven. We were called to reflect heaven on earth. So let me give you some new choices, some new choices to make as we begin this series learning how to quit and what to quit, church. All right, let me give you some new choices to make to reflect heaven on earth. Here's number one. If you're taking notes, write it down, you guys. Here's number one. Be loyal. Be loyal to his people. And this, is, and this word comes with some tension. Can I just, can I just I'm going to call that out for a moment, okay? Because loyal, this word loyalty and loyal comes with tension because in our lifetime, in, in our time, we have seen, there's been so much mistrust that has built right? Like it's hard to trust. Like we, it's hard to, to trust our businesses and big businesses. We've seen it, okay? It's our governments and, and people and, and, and even churches we've seen. It's hard. It's hard, but can I tell you something? 
Loyalty is a big deal to God. Loyalty is all over the scripture, all throughout scripture. God encourages and commands us to be loyal to him, loyal to his call, loyal to his mission, loyal to his kingdom, loyal to his purpose. It's a big deal to God, and it should be a big deal to us. All throughout the, the, the earth, all over the earth, in every language, one of the most treasured words is loyalty. No matter what language you go to, loyalty is one of the most treasured words. Some of the synonyms for loyalty, the other words for it is faithfulness, wholeheartedness, fidelity, devotion. See, God, God has called us to be loyal to him and to his people, to be, to be loyal you guys, and God has called us to do this. Um, why? Why be loyal? Because God has some promises he's made. He has some promises attached to your loyalty where he says, hey, if, you, if, you fa- if you're faithful to me, I will show up in your life. Look here in Proverbs chapter 21. It says, he who pursues righteousness and what? You pursue loyalty, you're going to find life. See, Jeremiah 33 says, God says, you, when you pursue me with your whole heart, you will find me. With wholeheartedness. He's saying, when you pursue me with loyalty, with devotion, wholeheartedly, you will find, you can't even find God without this, he says. Unless you are wholehearted, you can't really, God can't even show you life unless it's wholehearted devotion. He said, if you you pursue righteousness and loyalty, you'll find life, righteousness, and honor. God says, I will honor you. I will, I will lift you up. I will promote you. If you, if you just, this is how Psalms 18 says it. Psalm 18 says, God, Lord, you are loyal to those who are loyal. Now, now look, God, God will always love you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Now that's, I'm talking about the God showing up in your life, honoring you, prom- promoting you. God says, hey, you're loyal to me. I'll show up in your life. L- listen, a lot of people like to think that God is their genie in a bottle. Like he's your Santa Claus or he's your, he's your wish machine, that when trial comes and difficulty comes, that you can just throw up a Hail Mary prayer for peace or something like that, and God's going to wave his wand and peace is going to like overcome you. That's not how it works. There is a peace that surpasses all understanding, but there's a com- conditional promise to that peace that surpasses all understanding, that we would fix our minds on things that are unseen, not seen, on things that are in heaven, not earth. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So look, God says, I want to show up for your life. I'd like to give you the strength, the joy, the, the success, the, the uh, peace. I'd like to give you all that stuff. But you need to, if you're loyal to me, I will show up in your life and give you what you need. We just, we got to learn how to quit, you guys, the right things and pick up some of these right things. And one of them, you guys, is loyalty. Here's the second thing. And this is how we reflect heaven to earth. The author of Hebrews is telling us, man, be loyal to, to his people. It's not the time to pull away. It's not the time to retreat. It's, it's, we should do it all the more now, he says. All the more. Here's the second way we reflect heaven on earth, and that is be loving to his people. God is love, man. Be loving to his people. Here's the command in John chapter 13. Jesus says, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other the same way that I loved you. See, he's giving you a commandment to make a commitment to love others. Now, every time we talk about loving others, especially when you talk about loving his people, right? And in one one part of the Bible, someone asked Jesus, like, who's my neighbor? Like, who are your people, God? Who's my neighbor? Who am I supposed to love? And he had to explain, like, is everybody. Everybody is his people. Everybody's his people. So let me, especially when I talk about loving God's people, like loving Christians and people that go to church, I in, inevitably, the conversation will go, oh, it's hard to love church people. I say, it's just, it's hard to, to fulfill this command to love like you've loved with them people. It's easier almost to love people outside. So let me just set the record straight with some things. Write some things, write these down with me about this whole loving people, okay? The only perfect person in church is Jesus, okay? Let's just get that straight. That's the, all, the only perfect person in church is Jesus. For too, for too long, the church has tried to put on the perception of perfect. Like, let's just put up a front of perfect, all right? And so many people come to church trying to put on a per- perception and perspective of perfect when God is not putting that expectation on you. 
You don't need to be perfect. He doesn't want you to be perfect. In fact, it's, count, it's like counterproductive to what he wants to do in your life. Can I tell you something? Please listen. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay. I mean, we're all on this journey figuring it out and have the issues that pop up sometimes. You thought you crucified that thing. It comes up again. It's okay to not be okay. Hey, that's why the author of Hebrews says we need each other, does it? We need each other. It's okay. And check it out. It's not only okay for you to not be okay. Listen, it's okay for others not to be okay too. It's okay. It's okay. The same grace that you, like you, it goes for other people. It's okay. We're working it out. And once you understand that, you can actually start loving people well. And that's here. This is the second. God created, look, God created all people. And we must love all people well. All right? I, I, my heart is, and discovery is, a place where no matter what you believe, no matter what you dress like, no matter what your status economically is, no matter what your issues are, no matter what your lifestyle is, no matter what your preference is, this is a place where you can experience the love of God and be loved by us too. All right? That's, that's what discovery is. Why? Because God loves all people. And, and, and we must love all people well. Now, here's another cultural thing that's creeped into the church. Just because I, I don't agree with your version of truth and my truth lines up with the word of God doesn't mean I can't love you and be kind to you and respect you. Okay? All right? The, I, we can have, have disagreements on, and, still be, and still love each other, be kind and respecting to one another. In fact, when you take the next steps, if you haven't been on to the next steps, I go over just the five things we don't have like a list of, you know, 50 things that are, are tenets of faith that you need to believe in order to, in order to be here at Discovery. You know, there's five things, and all of them, honestly, if you're a Christian, you believe those five things, I guarantee. Okay? Because too long, the church has argued over what divides them instead of, you know, gathered under what unites them. For too long. Hey, church, we got to, God created all, all people, and we must love all people well. And then lastly, about this subject, God directs us to attack people not problem. Not God, sorry. God, <laughs> God directs us to attack problems, not people. I'm thinking about football. I'm sorry, man. I mean, I'm, I want to, Tampa Bay Buccaneers are going down. Uh, look, people aren't the problem. They're not the problem. They're never the problem. They're created by God, loved by God. They're, they're not the, God, we're, we're called to attack the problem, not the person. I love this, this verse here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The, it's the love chapter. In the Amplified Version, it says, Love bears all things, regardless of what comes. It believes all things. Look at this. Looking for the best in each one. Look, if you look for the problem in, in, in somebody, you're going to find it every time. If you look for the problem in me, I promise you, i got enough of them. You're going to find some problems. If you look for the problem in the church, you're going to find plenty of problems. But God didn't call you to be a problem inspector. He calls you to be a lover of all people, to believe all things, looking not for the problem, but for the best in each one. You're not, you're not to attack those people. You're not to look for the problems in people. You're, you're called to look to the best and for the best in each one, it hopes all things, remaining steadfast during difficult times. And we're going to talk about that because life does get difficult. It does. I understand that. Because earth is not heaven. It's not. never will be. So there will be that. We, it endures all things without weakening. And that's God has called us to be the church. In order to be the church, we need to learn how, what to quit, <laughs> guys. That earth is not going to be heaven, but we're to reflect heaven on earth. How do we do that? By being loyal. Hey, church, the, the church should be the most loyal, faithful, steadfast, wholehearted, devoted people on the face of the earth. Amen? That the church should be, uh, the, uh, should be the most loyal people on the face of the earth. The church should be the most loving people on the face of the earth because we know the God who is love and unconditional love. Amen? Amen. So here's the third reason, third way uh, that we can reflect heaven on earth. Be loyal, be love. And be light. Because it does. To, to, to the world. Yeah, because it's dark. It gets ugly. It's difficult. Sometimes you're the only light in a dark place. And it's hard. It's really hard in the midst of it. But look at this. Your true self surfaces when things don't go your way. Your, your true self shows up in those difficult times. And it's, 
when you're the only when when you're the only light your true self surfaces when it's when earth your earth experience is not heaven it's not meeting your expectation the people aren't meeting your expectation god ain't meeting your expectation the church ain't meeting your expectation your job ain't meeting your expectation your true self surfaces in the dark place will you be loyal or will you choose convenience over commitment will you be loving to all people and they spit in your face and blaspheme you and persecute you and speak evil of you? Will you be light when the earth just gets more and more dark? Hey, this is how we, this is what God has called the church to be, to do, to reflect heaven on earth. And if you want to win, church, you got to learn when to quit. Galatians chapter 6, let me give you one, two, two quick last verses. i got to hurry. Each of you must take responsibility. Here's another thing. Culture, again, influencing the church. Hey, church, we got to take responsibility. It is for doing our creative best with what? With your own life. Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer. This then is how you should pray, Jesus says. This is what I want you to do. I want you to ask the Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are called to reflect heaven on earth. We are called to be the church. Amen. Go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes. Let me close in some prayer, you guys. I thank you, God, for what you are doing. God, that, that there's so many of us that know how to win. We know your word. We know your truth. We know the principles. We've heard many sermons, God, but, but knowing how to win and be successful is not our challenge. I, I believe for a lot of us, our challenge is not knowing how to win. It's knowing what to quit. We don't know what to let go of. There's some things that we're holding on to that we haven't let go of that are undermining us, that it's, it, it's, it's robbing us of the life that you've called us to live that is truly life of accessing the promises of joy and strength and peace and power even of your presence in our lives help us God to not let this culture and society influence our relationships with you with your church with the important people in our life God that we would be different live different we would learn how to quit the things that we need to quit so that we can win. If you're here today and maybe maybe a decision you need, you need to make is maybe you're either choosing pleasure over promise or convenience over commitment. Maybe you're, but one of the decisions, the most important decision you can make is choosing to give Jesus your life. And in order to do that, listen, you gotta quit the control. You gotta surrender. In order to access that life, you got to quit being your own God, your own Lord. And for some of you here today, you're in control of your own life. And really, that's what salvation is. Salvation is when you let go of the control of your life and you give it to Jesus. The Bible calls that lordship, that he is Lord, the control of your life. Hey, thanks for joining in for our Quit Church series. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you come back for the next installment in this series.